welcome everyone to this year's first event. Uh, we were kind of late. Usually we have the first event in September and some years even in August, but it was a, a kind of crazy year for me. So it was not that easy. It wasn't that easy. Robert is here with us uh, to start this year with some great tips on, ah yeah, before I go there, sorry. It's been a summer and I forgot everything. Um, I am recording this event and I'm planning after Robert allowed us, kindly allowed us to publish it in YouTube. So whoever didn't see it, and it seems it will be a lot of people that will not join the event, will have a second chance of viewing the event uh, on YouTube. So if you object anyway, just let me know and uh, yeah, we'll see what we will do. Now, that's me. Uh, no point in getting in any deeper in this slide or uh, this Actually, presentation was from the presentation I made, and this slide was in it. So let's quickly go after it. And today we will see advanced fiddler techniques with Robert Bedingheimer. He was also Robert was with us last September, I think. It was uh, with Cryptography One One, and so it's a it seems it's a yearly thing. Maybe we'll do it every year in around September, October. We'll have a we'll have an event here in Munich with Robert. And yeah, this is Robert. Um, for those of you that don't already know him, he's, uh, he works in Svans Home Delivery, providing business solutions with web technologies, and he's a Microsoft MVP. Of course, uh, he's a Fiddler expert, and of course, he's a plural site author. I, I skip the part that you're a black belt in uh, Taekwondo. I think I made this joke last year to go easy on you with the questions. <laughs> so <laughs> I think, uh, Robert, I don't have many things to say, so the stage is yours. Uh, okay. Sounds I will good. be just one note. I will be in the background um, monitoring the conversation for any questions and then pass it on to Robert uh, once we have some. So enjoy. Okay. So it won't let me share the screen until you stop sharing, it says. so. Yep, I will now. All right. Let me know if you can see that. Okay. That it's, good? It's, it's super, yeah. All right. All right, we'll get started. We're going to talk about advanced fiddler techniques. I won't spend a lot of time on this. We kind of already reviewed some of this, but I do have my Twitter, my email, and my blog information, and I am making the slides available. So at the very end, I have a link where you can get all of the slides. So when we talk about Fiddler, we're going to be deep into HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol. So I did want to give you these specs. So these are the formal RFCs for HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2. And the reason I give them to you is, I mean, we're going to be looking at network traces. So the protocol between the browser and the server is HTTP, HTTPS, hopefully for everyone. Uh, these documents do give all of the official rules. <clears throat> so there have been times where things didn't quite behave how I expected. And it was nice to be able to refer to the standards document. It doesn't mean everybody follows the standards, but it's helpful to know what the rules are, especially that I looked up things on caching and such. They're very approachable documents. I did put the HTTP2 in italics only because currently uh, it's not supported in Fiddler. So that's coming soon in Fiddler everywhere. But I just wanted you to know if you're trying to troubleshoot something you believe is HTTP2 specific, when you open up Fiddler, it's actually going to fall back to use HTTP 1.1 today. HTTP is a request and a response paradigm. So for each request sent from the browser to the server and the response, you'll see both a header and a body. But that's how the communication starts. The client initiates a request, gets a response back. So that's the protocols we're going to talk about. So what is Fiddler? So Fiddler is a tracing tool that was built specifically for HTTP and HTTPS. So this Eric Lawrence originally started this. He was working at Microsoft, I think, on the ClipArt team. People would order ClipArt online many years ago, and they would call in and say, I couldn't download this. And Eric noticed the support personnel didn't really have any good way to troubleshoot what the problems were. Back then, 
Uh, primary tool would probably be like Microsoft Network Monitor and similar to Wireshark today. So it was a pretty low level. You had to kind of assemble the packets to see a, a complete request and a response. So um, Eric didn't know .NET, didn't know C Sharp, really didn't know HTTP that well, he said, and he learned all those things and, and wrote Fiddler, which I always find amazing. It was acquired by Telerik in 2012 and now owned by Progress. And I gave you a link where you can get the tool. There's actually two versions now. So Fiddler Everywhere is the newer version. It's cross-platform. So it runs Windows, Linux, Mac. It's got a newer user interface, um, more streamlined. It has some nice collaboration features. There's still Fiddler Classic uh, specific to Windows. I'm gonna use Fiddler Classic through most of the talk only because Fiddler Everywhere is gaining features with each release. A lot of the techniques that I'm gonna show you are specific to Classic for now. I'm just showing them to you so you can use them if you want in Classic and you have an eye forward to, I hope these all surface in everywhere someday. I'm more interested that you understand that these are useful techniques, they're practical things, um, but you can choose the one that works for you. Like I said, I'm gonna use Fiddler Classic. I'll try to call out at the very end, I've got, I, I will show you Fiddler everywhere and I'll mention some of the things we showed that aren't there yet. So with that, how does Fiddler work? So Fiddler is a proxy. So I'm gonna go over to, I'm using the new Edge browser. If I go into settings system and we look at the proxy settings by default, I don't have a proxy server set up on my home network. So I'm just connecting directly from here out to the internet. What happens is when I start up Fiddler Classic, this is going, it's an app running on a specific port. So it's sitting running on port 8888 on my local machine. So if I were to go back here and look, you can see that now it's set up. So Fiddler has now told Windows, <clears throat> I'm a proxy for HTTP and HTTPS traffic. Modern browsers pick this up automatically. So you can see it's gone in and Edge now sees that I'm going to 127.0.0.1. Um, the joke there, right? If you've ever seen, I have the t-shirt, there's no place like 127.0.0.1. That's home, this is my own laptop. So right now it's pointing at port 8888, eight, which is running on my local machine. That's where Fiddler's running. <clears throat> so now the browser knows if I have HTTP or HTTPS traffic, I wanna send it over to that IP address on that port. So Fiddler is now sitting between the client and the server. So if I were to go make a request, I may have to, I'm just gonna clear this and hit Control F5, because I probably have that cached. So I made up a fake travel page uh, using Bootstrap, pretty typical page, I think, um, not a designer. So I liked using Bootstrap and getting that to work. And you can see this is, we are talking about HTTP. Again, because it's a proxy now, all of the requests go from my browser to Fiddler, and then Fiddler creates its own connection out to the actual web server. In this case, the web server is running on my own machine. I'm guessing a lot of you have probably used Fiddler, so I won't spend a lot of time on the basics, but I can come in at the inspectors, take off compression, and I can see that this was the response. We talked about here the headers that come back, and here's the actual HTML. And then on top, you've got the same thing. You've got the request that was sent broken into headers and body. But the reason this is important is it's not acting like a Wireshark was. If I start up Wireshark on my machine, I tell it which network interface to watch and it's capturing all traffic on that network interface. Fiddler is specifically saying, I'm an app. I'm running over here on this port. As long as you choose to direct your traffic to me and it's HTTP or HTTPS, I'll be able to see it and do things with it. So if you're ever doing tracing and you're not seeing things show up in Fiddler, you have to look into, does your client understand how to set proxy settings, which I'll talk about a bit later. So the terminology that they chose to use in Fiddler is a web session. So I'm an ASP.NET developer. So I think of a session as you know my, all of the requests I make. When they talk about in documentation and stuff, a web session is just a single request and response. So there's a lot of things I can do with a web session. So first of all, I can do some marking and commenting. 
So I often send Fiddler Trace to other developers, uh, security, my operations group, potentially to vendors, and I may wanna call out things. So I can come here and say this bootstrap, if I were to look at it, maybe I would say, you know, I want you to use another version. I can come in here and put a comment, like, please upgrade. And then to make sure it catches their attention, I can mark it with a color. So now when people see it, they see that's specifically the session I'm talking about. And you can go double click and see and read those comments. But other things I can do, I can right click, you can see there's a lot of things available. I can save this. So if for some reason I wanted to use this in another project and I wanted to make sure I had the same version, I can just save the response, response body and then store it somewhere on the desktop or wherever I want. I can also remove it from the list here if I don't wanna see it. I can do some simple filtering, which we'll talk about later. But if I said, I don't wanna see any CSS, if I pick that, it will drop all the other sessions that are in the slash CSS folder. We'll look at some of these other ones a bit as we go, but there are a lot of things I can do on that individual session. Another thing I wanna be able to do is do a search. So I may look at this trace and say, well, I see this halflings font. Uh, I'm not sure why that's there. So I work on a pretty large site. We have content from multiple developers. We've got other front end people, maybe even vendors that are giving me things I need to use. I might not realize why is this file being included? So I can come into Fiddler, I can do a find. I'm just gonna type half links, hit enter. And you can see it, it highlighted that particular file, but that isn't really what I was looking for. I was trying to figure out who included that file. So if I look at the find sessions, the thing we'll notice is this decode compressed content. So I talked earlier about compression. If you're doing performance things, you should be compressing your CSS, JavaScript and such. I wanna to click to decode that. Fiddler is sitting again between the server and the client. It got a compressed version of all of these files. So by default, it doesn't search within those files when they're compressed. So just note, if you're not finding stuff in search, Make sure you click that. If I do that again, now it's done the decompression and it tells me that's included because of bootstrap. So now I can go into that CSS file and see why was that included. It's because it came from that. Another handy way to do that, you can actually just say select parent request and it'll end up doing the same thing. It's gonna trace back and it's gonna figure out that that came from bootstrap. So it's very often useful when you see a trace, there's a bunch of stuff, you're not sure where it comes from. Uh, both of those things are helpful. Another cool thing I can select, I'm gonna move this over just a hair. If I wanted to see all of the sessions that were a JPEG, you can actually hold the Alt key and click on the value in any column and it will find matching values for that column. So it immediately tells me here are all the JPEG files or maybe um, if I click up here, it'll be here are all the CSS files. I click in the right place. So this is a handy way, whatever the column is, if I wanna see all the 404s, you just have to hold the Alt key and click on that value. Next, we'll talk about decrypting HTTPS. So if you're not using HTTPS for your site, please do. Uh, there's a ton of reasons. I have a whole talk on why you need to use HTTPS, all the features it gives you. But the problem is now I wanna troubleshoot. So I've got Fiddler and it's sitting between the browser and the server and all of the stuff should be encrypted. How am I gonna see that stuff? And I did note, shouldn't be using SSL anymore. You should be using TLS 1.2 or ideally 1.3. Just by turning on 1.3, our site got 20% faster just because of some of the connection uh, improvements. So it should disturb you and I'll show you first. You know, I set up a page on using HTTPS. You can see that here. By default, if I go into Fiddler, this is what I would see. I see that there's a tunnel that went to, it shows me which host it went to, but I can't see any of the actual data. That's what we want, right? With HTTPS, I don't want people sitting in the middle to be able to see this stuff. However, I need to troubleshoot. So what Fiddler does, I can actually go into options, HTTPS. 
I can say I want to decrypt HTTPS traffic. So I've already done this on my machine. Had I not done it before, it would pop up and tell me, um, do I want to trust Fiddler to be a certificate authority? It'll actually ask you about five times as you go through the screens. If you're familiar with how HTTPS works, the people who create the website get a server certificate and that gets issued by a certificate authority. So someone trusted like Let's Encrypt, et cetera, issue those certificates to the site owners. Now that Fiddler is sitting in the middle, what it's gonna do is it says, I want you to trust me to be a certificate authority on your machine. So what will happen now, I said, please decrypt. Again, had I not done this before, I would have said, yes, go ahead and trust Fiddler root. I'm gonna hit okay. I'm gonna close the browser here just to make sure that that gets picked up or close Fiddler, excuse me. I'm gonna go back and hit control F5. And if all is right, I should see that traffic. So now you can see the stuff we saw before. So I can see the CSS file. If I were to take off compression, that's the actual file. So again, because Fiddler sits between, by default, it can't see the HTTPS traffic. And so by doing this, I'm saying, I trust Fiddler to issue a certificate. So in my case, I was going out to this Bodhi-PA Azure websites.net. If I were to go in here now, and let's look at DevTools, security, and view the certificate, you can see that Azure websites.net was issued by Do Not Trust Fiddler. So Fiddler sat in between and said, I'm going to create a fake certificate with this site's name. I'm gonna give that to you. So the browser encrypts it using this certificate because Fiddler owns that, it can decrypt it, show you all the traffic. Then it goes out to the real website, gets its certificate and re-encrypts it. So it's still safe on the wire. And I'm only doing this on my own machine. I'm trusting that I want to decrypt my own stuff. But this was really important because years ago, this wasn't a feature. As we started using more HTTPS, parts of our site just got dark. I couldn't troubleshoot them anymore. So it was very helpful that they added this ability to be able to do that. It'll come in later when we talk about uh, device tracing too, but just be aware that it can decrypt HTTPS. That's how that actually works. Next thing we'll talk about is filters and I'll just show you what they look like. So there's another tab in here where I can do a lot of specific things that I might want to filter out of this list. And I can also make some small modifications, which we'll see. So the first thing you'll notice as you're tracing, if you're using Fiddler, you'll notice other stuff is going on in the background that I wasn't necessarily doing. You can see some stuff with Zoom and stuff. I can come down here and say, I only wanna see web browser traffic. That'll cut down some of this. But if I'm still seeing stuff I don't want to see, I can actually come and say I want to see um, only from specific hosts. So I could say I only want to see traffic from that Bodhi-PA Azure websites. That way I'm just not being cluttered with things I don't need to see. I can also come in and say I don't want to see anything other than traffic from a specific version of Edge. So I can look at the Edge process and figure out the process ID of my browser pick that, I'll only see traffic from that browser. So if you're having a problem with getting a bunch of stuff you don't wanna see, look into those options. The next cool thing here is you can actually make modifications. So this is where Fiddler gets very interesting. So you can use Wireshark, you can use DevTools. Um, those are helpful for doing some of these basic traces, but I actually want to change the traffic in this case. So if I were to look at Bootstrap here, and I look at the inspectors. So one of the things that gets sent compression works by the client sending this header and says, I accept encoding. I know how to handle gzip, deflate, and broadly compression. So what you can do is you can go into the filters and say, I want to make a modification. So when the client sends to me, I want to delete that accept encoding header before I send it to the server. So if I were to go back, I'll clear this and I'll hit control F5. Now that request for bootstrap came here, 
Fiddler then chose to delete that. And you can see before it was about 20 or 30K, and now it's 160K. So if I were to look at inspectors before, it had a little kind of gold bar here saying it was compressed. If I look, it's not compressed anymore. So that's one of the cool things about uh, the Fiddler that really makes it unique. It's a tool that's gonna let me make these changes uh, while it sits in the middle. And so this is one place to do very simple changes. I can also come down here, for instance, um, I may wanna see what would happen if my CSS files were not working. So I host all my CSS files on a CDN. What if my CDN is down? What, what's the page gonna look like? Not surprisingly, it looks pretty horrible, right? Why would I wanna do this? Well, I can inline CSS. So I'm gonna turn this back off. If you've heard of inlining, I could look at my page and say, you know, I wanna make sure at least this gray top header shows up, maybe this. I could take that CSS, instead of having it in that separate CSS sheet, I could embed that directly into my HTML. That makes me more fail safe, right? How would I test that? Well, it's not easy to test failures necessarily. The filters makes it where I could go click that and say, did I do it right? I hit control F5. No, I didn't, right? It's a quick way for me to do some testing and see, am I doing, I didn't bother to do this for this site, but maybe that makes sense for me if the CDN might be down. Another interesting thing, if you do GDPR and you need to know all of the vendors or various files in your site that set cookies, you can actually say flag responses that set cookies. Now, I don't have any in this particular site. If I did that and hit control F5, all the ones that set a cookie would be in italics. So I could quickly identify, do I know which vendors are actually setting cookies? That would be a quick way to find out. So filters are very helpful. Um, to do some really basic stuff. We'll look at some other techniques here going forward. Now we'll talk about Composer. So this again is where Fiddler really shines. It's the ability actually Fiddler got its name because you can fiddle with the request. In other words, you're sitting between client and the server. The Composer is going to let me change everything about my request if I want to do that. So I'll clear this. We'll go back to my test page. So what I can do is I can go to Composer. Now what I can do is I can type an entire request. I could literally come here and say, I wanna type it all by hand. Um, I'm not that bored. I don't wanna do that. I'll drag over an existing request. So I wanna see the bootstrap request, but I wanna see what happens again. What if I took that accept encoding off again? So I can literally just delete that and hit execute. And now you can see instead of being 36K, it's 160K because I sent a request that didn't have that. The composer is very powerful because it lets me test things that might be hard to simulate in a browser alone. So a better example might be <clears throat> if I were to go out to this site, I'm gonna order one of these really uh, new looking tablets. I'll order one of those and it tells me it costs 1,095 US dollars. So I can drag this over. What I wanna see is, are my developers coding this correctly? If I drag the request over, the first thing that stands out to me, you can see that it posts the price. So that's one of the parameters that the client is sending to the server. Well, it better not be used, right? If I were to change this to a buck and hit execute, they better be doing stuff on the server. That better not be where the price comes from, from the security perspective and everything else. So if I hit execute and I go back and I look at the inspectors, I'm gonna decompress that, look at the raw view. I'll pop it in the notepad so it's a little easier to read. This order will be billed for a dollar each. So, oops, right? Somebody did something tragically wrong there on a lot of levels. And again, this would be hard for me to simulate and test uh, Fiddler makes that very easy via Composer to just change that request however I want and see how the server responds. I do a lot of security testing. And so sometimes I'll get, um, people will send to me and say, you know, run this curl command and you'll see what happens on your site. I looked for a while to try to find a good, safe uh, Windows curl tool. And I didn't realize that that's actually built here into Composer. There's a scratch pad 
So if you're familiar with curl, curl's just a client, usually command line client that lets me run requests. I'm just saying curl, go to bing.com, I'll execute that. Oops, didn't do the curl part when I highlighted. There's the request, and if I look at the inspectors, you can see it came from curl slash fiddler, made a request to Bing, and then got HTML back. So just so if you know, if you need to do things with curl, um, there's a scratch pad here where you can do all that stuff. Another powerful feature is the ability to set breakpoints. So I'm going to clear this. I'm going to talk about this quick exec area down here. It's kind of a, if you like command line interfaces, there's a lot of things you can do in Fiddler Classic here. So I'm going to type BPU bootstrap min.css. So what that's saying is I want to set up a breakpoint. When the client sends me that bootstrap file, I want you to pause before you send it to the server. So now I'm going to come back. I will request that page again. I hit Control F5. You'll see the icon starts glowing. It's sitting here waiting on sending that bootstrap request. So if I go into the inspectors, again, I can play with the request on the fly. So I'll take off that accept encoding to keep our theme going. And I will just say run to completion. So now it's sent to the server. And now the server came back with a now non-compressed. So again, just another way for me to get in between the client and the server. So I'm going to type BPU and just clear that out. I'm going to type BP after site.css. So I had some problems with CSS. Um, long story short, we were bundling all of our CSS files together in HTTP 1.1 to reduce the number of requests we made. It turns out Internet Explorer has a limit of 4,096 unique styles per style sheet. I didn't know this. Worked fine. As we added some more styles in a future release, um, the styles didn't show up. We didn't know why. And it was not easy to troubleshoot. And it was not well documented at the time. So what I did is I said, I want to run Fiddler. I'm just going to hit Control F5 here again. So the server sent the request. The CSS is coming down. I want to tweak with the CSS on the fly before I send it to the client. So in this case, I'm just going to play with this color and make it red and hit run to completion. And now the client doesn't know it didn't come from the server, right? Fiddler sat in between. By using breakpoints, I could literally change anything I wanted. So in my example, I was just deleting some CSS and I noticed, hey, now it works. That's weird. Is it because that CSS is wrong? And it eventually got to where I figured out it had to be a size thing. And then I started to search and found an obscure reference to it. But the point is Fiddler is powerful because it's sitting in between and it gives me these various hooks and the breakpoint if you want to be able to manually go in and make any kind of change you want to the file either on the way to the server or on the way back that's cool to be able to use breakpoints another one is autoresponder and this is called rules and fiddler everywhere now but because fiddler is a proxy I can have the client make a request and instead of going to the web server, I can just serve it myself. And so I'm going to show you what that would look like. So I'm going to take the auto responder. I can just drag over. We'll pick on bootstrap CSS here. I'm going to drag this over here and now I can do a bunch of different things. So the first thing I can do, I'm going to test out um, a delay. So this is in milliseconds. So I'm going to say 15,000 milliseconds. I'm going to save that rule. So now anytime the client asks for that specific URL, it's going to delay it by 15 seconds. Again, why would I want to do this? Well, you can see this is my customer's experience. If I'm pulling a CSS from a CDN or a vendor and it's blocked, this is what happens. It blocks rendering from my clients. Again, that would be hard to troubleshoot. You can make dev tools be slow. Um, you can say it's 2G or 3G connection, but that's all of your requests. The cool thing with Fiddler is I can make very specific rules for specific URLs. So not only can I delay, <clears throat> I can actually do 404s or 500s. So I like when we work with new vendors, a vendor might say, please put this, you know, they all say this, put this JavaScript in the head of the page because our stuff is the most important and it, you know, won't hurt anything on yours. Um, so I say, that's fine. I drop the JavaScript in. I come in here and I make it slow or fail. 
and then I run my site and say, you know, it either does or doesn't impact stuff, but it's a way for me to tell how dependent am I on third party things. So that's a cool way to be able to come in here and specify basically whatever I need to specify. I can also serve local files. So let's do that. There's a couple of different ways to do this. I'm gonna just go to this site CSS again. And if I were to say unlock for editing, I can actually now make a change. So I'm gonna show you the other way I prefer to do. I'm gonna actually just save this on my desktop. So I'm gonna save this, call it site CSS, save it on my desktop. And I'm gonna take this guy out. I'm gonna take out the delay too. And now I can just say, if you see that, I want you to serve a file. This just lets me make a bunch of different changes to it. Go to the desktop. So if I were to open up that CSS file now, let's change this to, I don't know, purple. So again, because I'm sitting in between, you can see it's changed it. So I can actually, people have done this before where they said I have a really important demo and I can't have this fail. They can actually set up autoresponder rules in Fiddler. You can actually copy the whole page with all of its resources and set up rules with regular expressions and such so that you can run as if I'm using the client. It looks like I'm going to the actual web server, but it's really Fiddler serving it. So you could try to do your demo and if it's failing miserably, you could come in and light up your autoresponder rules and suddenly it'll all serve off your local machine. And again, I can make any kind of modifications I want. So again, that's one of the more powerful. This is one of the things that's really difficult to pull off in other tools when needing to do web troubleshooting. So Fiddler Classic, even Fiddler Everywhere um, are running on, let's do Classic first. I'm running on my Windows laptop, um, but I have an iPhone, right? Even with Fiddler Everywhere, I'm not gonna run that on my iPhone. So I wanna be able to run Fiddler on a device. So I'm, I'm running Fiddler Classic on my laptop on Windows. And yet I wanna see the traffic that comes from an iPhone, for instance. So if you remember how Fiddler works, this is another advantage of it not looking at that network card. Because it's a proxy, I can basically go to the device and configure that device's proxy server and point it at my laptop. So what I would do, I would go do a command prompt on Windows. I would get my laptop's IP address, and then I would go set up my device. So let's pull up some device settings here. So it turns out on an iPhone, you don't set the proxy in the browser. You actually set it on your Wi-Fi connection. So at home here, I'm, I'm on my Wi-Fi network. I have my iPhone. I have my Windows laptops. So I was doing this yesterday to troubleshoot a problem. I found out the IP address of my laptop and I put the 8888 for the port. Now that I've got that set up on my iPhone, any traffic, you know, I go into Edge on my iPhone, I'm typing in wherever I'm going, that's now being routed over to my Windows laptop and I'm able to see that trace. So if you can see, here's what my phone looked like. And if I pull up the trace from Fiddler, We'll see, hopefully down here. If I look at the inspector, you can see it's from an iPhone. So again, everything I've talked about, it's not just simple tracing. <clears throat> I, I am now routing traffic through Fiddler. So I can decrypt the HTTPS, I can do breakpoints, I can modify the files. So again, I can do all the things I need to do with Fiddler even though the device I'm working with is a phone, a tablet, um, whatever the device happens to be, as long as I can proxy that traffic from that device. Um, if it turns out some devices are hard to um, set up their proxy. So just be aware there's Fiddler documentation about how to set yourself up as a reverse proxy. So I'm not gonna go through that here, but you can do that as another option to trace devices that don't understand how to set a proxy. We'll talk about a few common issues you'll see with Fiddler. 
So one of them, this I fall for this all the time. As soon as I get the trace that I want, I don't want other traffic being traced. So I'll come down and turn off the capture. I will often forget that. So I will come back, um, try to do my troubleshooting again. I'll hit control five and I don't see any of the traffic. So if you do that, just be aware that make sure it's capturing. Another thing that people have done, you can drag this any process and drop it on a specific browser that will set up to only trace traffic from that browser. <clears throat> so people would do that, then they would close their browser, open a browser again. Well, that has a different process ID. So now Fiddler can't see any of the traffic. So just be aware if you do either of those two things, make sure you double check that you have enabled it again for everywhere. The other thing is, so I'm an ASP.NET developer. I'm running IIS on my laptop. So when I open up Fiddler, I can see the traffic from my client browser to my ASP.NET page. However, my ASP.NET page might call a bunch of other HTTPS, hopefully based services. By default, those don't show up in Fiddler. So people will often trace and say, well, I can see the client talking to the server, but I can't see all the backend calls, even though they're HTTP. Well, it turns out that .NET does not pick up the proxy setting from Windows by default. So you can actually go in your config file and say, I want to proxy all of the .NET class traffic to go through that same IP and port. Then I'll be able to see all of those um, backend calls to other services. So again, the key, I'll see it a lot on forums and stuff. People say, you know, I'm opening Fiddler, it's not tracing anything. And again, the key is it's not just watching your network card, you have to make sure the client knows that it needs to proxy that traffic over to where Fiddler is running. Next, we'll talk about Fiddler script. So I showed you how you could do breakpoints, how you could do filters so you could modify things. Uh, Fiddler Classic has scripting built in. So you can actually programmatically write things that would happen on the fly. And there's a number of events we'll look at here. So the on before request would be similar to as I'm sending it to the server, I want to do something. On before response would be the server sending back to me, but I want to do something before I send it to the client. And the on exec action lets me extend the um, quick exec area down here. So I'm just going to go in and say customize rules. I'm going to search here for what I'm looking for to find it a little faster. So this is they call it jscript.net. Um, it has IntelliSense and stuff. It looks sort of JavaScript-y, um, kind of .NET-y at the same time. But what I can do is I've got this on before request. So before it sends it to the server, in this case, it doesn't matter if I do it on the way up or the way back. I just say, look, I want you to highlight every JPEG and make it look yellow for some reason. I want it to stand out more. So if I go back and... Let's hit control F5 again. So I'm just modifying what the sessions look like by doing that rule. I can also make programmatic changes to things. And so a, a practical thing I've used this for, I basically wrote it and said, if you see a request, you can do a host name. I wanted to make sure that my site would work if only my servers and my CDN was awake all of the other third-party vendors that I use, I want to make sure that none of them could cause me to be slow or break. So I could go an autoresponder and drag over every vendor and set a rule for them. That's not fun. I just wrote a rule that basically said, if the host name is not my primary domain or my CDN domain, then osession.response code like this, uh, return a 500 or 404 or, or sleep for whatever amount of time. So I could cause all of those third parties to fail and then go in and see that my site was still okay, which was very helpful because I found things that I thought I had taken care of that I didn't. And again, I'm doing that programmatically rather than have to do all that by hand, which is cool. The other one I'll show you in here, I can extend the quick exec area. So I decided to write my own quick exec action called RH, which just means remove host. So I'm gonna go out here, let's go to Bing, not responsible for anything that comes up. All right, so I can look in here and say, well, I, I wanna see stuff from Bing, but maybe I don't wanna see, see if there's one I can get rid of here. 
we'll just get rid of Bing because that's easy enough. I can just say rh www.bing.com and you see all of those are gone. So it matched on all of those specific hosts. So it's just a, another way I can extend how Fiddler is behaving, um, writing a little bit of code. So I'm going to take off my JPEG highlighting here because that's going to annoy me after a bit. So got that turned off. I'll just clear that. So that is Fiddler script. Again, a uh, very handy way if you want to programmatically be able to make changes on the fly to things that are going back and forth. Fiddler also has extensions. So I gave you a link for Fiddler Classic here where you can get these extensions. I'll talk about two of them primarily, the JavaScript formatter first. So I've got a particular page here. I hit Control F5. So you can see I've got minified JavaScript which you wanna do for performance reasons, right? But it's hard to read that. So if I were on the client in DevTools and I wanted to step through my jQuery, uh, it's all minified, it's harder to step through. Now in DevTools, they have a pretty print where I could go say, please you know, unminify this, but I have to do it for every single file. There's actually an extension, this JavaScript formatter that I downloaded. When you download it and install it, it just shows up here in, in the rules. If I go make this request again, because Fiddler is sitting in between, it noticed the two minified files and it unminified them. So now on the client, while I'm going into DevTools, I don't have to pretty print each of them. They'll automatically be unminified if I want to do that, which is helpful. The other one that's cool, I'm going to turn that back off. Clear this. It's called show image bloat. So let's go back here and hit Control F5. And you'll notice, well, that's weird. It, it's got these bricks and it says 43%. Every time you take pictures with your camera and your phone, there's metadata inside of that file. So it's the lat long potentially, it's your shutter speed, all this useful stuff as a photographer I might care about, um, not things that get displayed. So what this is telling me is that 43% of the size, so 10K of the 23K of this image is all of that metadata. So I use a tool called JPEG Tran. It's a command line tool that strips metadata out. So basically I could make this same image 43% smaller by removing the metadata. And what the image bloat in Fiddler does is it gives me a quick way to run through and review and visually see which images still have metadata in them. So I can see for some reason, I just didn't clear it out of all the ones in my header. And it shows me the savings I could get. So again, you can just go download that extension, turn that on. That's a good way to troubleshoot metadata problems. You can write your own extensions. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about a Pluralsight course I have. If you're interested in that, that we'll talk about how you can do that. So Fiddler's pretty easy to use, um, but I did run into technical or non-technical people. So like a vice president of marketing said, hey, the site's not working and I want them to be able to do a trace for me because I'm not sitting there. They actually create, there's a tool called Fiddler Cap. So this is a separate download and it's meant to make it really easy for someone to follow your instructions and get a capture. So I can say, hey, please clear your cookies, clear your cache. Not everyone knows how to do that. Or, hey, I need you to decrypt HTTPS traffic. They pick those options, they hit start capture, it will open a browser. They can do whatever they're gonna do. It'll trace it all. Then they say stop and save. Uh, then they can actually email that to me. I'll open it in real Fiddler and the trace looks like it was captured by Fiddler. It's just an easier way for people that are not familiar with a tool like Fiddler to be able to do the capture for you. Um, be aware there's a snapshot here. I know this has never happened to you, but I'll get a complaint that says, hey, this you know page didn't look right or didn't work. All they have to do is hit snapshot when the screen is up and it will actually take a picture and embed it into the capture. So I can actually see that. I'll, I'll tell you there's a new product, um, Fiddler Jam, that just got released. I've not used it a lot yet. Uh, it's a browser extension. So it's targeting the same concept and then some. So it's the ability for you, them to get an extension for their browser and make it really easy to trace a problem for a client and then forward it on to your developers and people to see. So either one of these two works. 
I don't love to install stuff on people's machines. I, again, never happened to you, I'm sure. But if I did put Fiddler Cap on their machine, about six months later, their printer is going to break and it's going to be my fault, right? So generally today, I don't want to install anything on their machine. I'll have them go into their proxy settings and set up to proxy to my laptop's IP address. So just like how I would trace an iPhone, I can just tell them manually change your proxy settings and it will route all the traffic to my windows where I can do the trace. So if I'm there when they're doing it, that's a good option. Otherwise, Fiddler Cap and Fiddler Jam are good options otherwise. Some quick miscellaneous things. Uh, I did show you how to save response files. So you can just right click and save an actual file. You can screenshot within Fiddler as well. So again, if I came back here and said, I'm gonna hit Control F5, there's a camera right here. I'm gonna hit that. It's gonna give me five seconds to get back where I wanna be. I'm hearing a little countdown. I hear a simulated camera. If I go back in now, the screenshot has a view of what their screen looked like. So now when I send this trace to someone else, they'll be able to see what the screen actually had rather than uh, it just didn't work, right? You can encrypt files. So I'm often sending this to potentially a third party vendor over the internet. You can actually save all sessions and say you want it to be password protected. I'll pick a file name. It will then ask me for a password. It's gonna use AES 128-bit encryption by default. So it's good encryption. I can configure Fiddler to use 256-bit if I want to. And then I'll able to send the trace file using AES encryption. So I'm sure that it won't be uh, broken and intercepted. Obviously, I'm not gonna put the password in the same email. Pro tip for today. Uh, somehow I need to communicate that password but the capability to store, especially if you're decrypting HTTPS, you might have credit cards or credentials or things that you shouldn't just share the archive without doing that kind of encryption. There's a text wizard built in. So if you need to do simple conversions, like I often have a something that's base64 encoded or URL encoded, I can come in here and do some basic conversions back and forth right within Fiddler. There is Fiddler Core, I'll just mention. So they basically extracted and made a headless version of Fiddler. So if you have an app that you want to embed uh, Fiddler tracing and stuff into, look at Fiddler Core. We talked about the quick exec area. So if I go back in here, I can do things down here. Like I want it greater than 50,000. It shows me the files that are bigger than uh, 50,000 bytes, I can say select CSS and it picks the CSS files. Uh, I can say equals and look for a certain status code. So if you like command line things, uh, quick exec will be your friend. And as I showed you earlier, you can actually write your own extensions if you wanna do that. Another cool feature is host remapping. So I'm gonna go to example.com. I can actually come in and say, I want to map hosts. I want example.com to really point at a site on my own machine. So now if I go hit control F5, we're going to be seeing the site I saw before. The browser still thinks it's example.com, but it's really serving off my machine. So I saw this years ago and I thought, why would I ever want to do that? That's not that helpful. Well, it turned out that some of the third-party JavaScript libraries we use on our site care that you're in production. So when I run on my own development machine and want to troubleshoot, they won't run. They say, hey, you're not running in prod, we won't run. So I was able to switch this host mapping. So the browser literally thought it was talking to my production server. So all the client code thought it was production, but I pointed it at my own laptop. So I could go in Visual Studio and do all the troubleshooting like I normally would, even though the client thought it was on WWW. So if you ever need to spoof out what host you think you're running on, that's a cool feature. So we've showed all the Fiddler Classic stuff. So I want to just show Fiddler everywhere here. So again, Fiddler everywhere, multi-platform. So for the first time, Mac and Linux can actually run Fiddler. It's an improved user interface. You'll see it's got been streamlined. It's um, a little easier to use. It's got collaboration features. So instead of doing a trace and having to 
encrypt it and save it off and then email it to someone. There's collaboration features built within the tool that I can share and it'll store cloud-based archives and stuff. The only parts that so far we're missing, uh, I talked about extensions, Fiddler script, breakpoints, quick exec, those are things that are not yet in Fiddler everywhere. Uh, every release it's getting better and adding new features. So I just wanna pop in there and show you some of the things we've already seen and how they would look in here. Pop over here and get ready to do, go back to this. So I'm gonna go hit control F5. You'll see the sessions look very familiar here. If I click on them, I can go look at the inspectors. I can see the same raw output with headers that I saw before. With Bootstrap, I can say edit in Composer. That will pop me directly into Composer and I have either the handy way up here to take off that accept encoding or I could just modify the raw like I did before. I'll say execute and we'll see again that our bootstrap now is no longer compressed. So you can do all the stuff you could with composer before. I can also click and say, I wanna add a new rule. So the, these rules are what was called auto responder before. And again, I can come in and choose, maybe I want to send, do a delay again. So let's do the 15,000. So the functionality that you would expect, and I'm gonna turn the rules on. If I go run this again, the composer and the rules slash autoresponder are still the same. Those have been implemented in everywhere. Cool feature here, I can see previous traces. So in the past, it was more difficult when you had one trace you wanted to compare against another. By storing it over here on the left-hand side, let me close a few of these. I have my previous saved sessions over here and you can see there's a little indicator that I shared this session with someone. If I just open this, now I can see the trace I did before alongside the one that I'm doing now. I can also easily turn off capturing like I usually do. So again, this has got a lot of the features that I want. Uh, I can also save off individual requests so if you have things like API requests that you want to run and execute, you can store them here and then have them get re-executed put them back in Composer to change them if you want. So again, newer user interface, cross-platform, most of the features. Um, if prior to this talk, maybe you haven't seen a lot of the advanced things that I showed you and you've been using Fiddler in other ways, it probably has everything you want already in Fiddler everywhere. Um, if you need some of these other features, as I said, hopefully those will gradually get pulled over into Fiddler everywhere. Some quick resources. So I do have two Pluralsight courses on Fiddler. The first one listed takes the approach that your website has a problem and should you use Fiddler or DevTools or both, right? Like your styles don't look right. What's the appropriate tool and what's the right procedure to figure out how to troubleshoot? That's the first course. Second one is very specific to just Fiddler and it walks through how do you create Fiddler extensions. A lot, a lot of these advanced techniques um, are all in that course. For Fiddler Classic, uh, excellent book from Eric Lawrence here. If you wanna read that, so I've read it probably at least 10 times. And every time I read it, I find something I didn't know, like the host remapping I, I had read, I don't know, seventh time through and I thought, that sounds interesting. I'm not sure why I would ever need that. So I just kind of put it aside. And then when I had that problem where the machine cared to think it was in production, but I needed to troubleshoot locally, I thought, oh, I do remember that, that that's a feature. So I could go in and find that. Again, that's my Twitter, my email, my blog, uh, the slides, and I don't have a lot of code for this, but the server side page um, are available there. And so I have time now if anybody had any specific questions they'd like to dig into. Nice. First of all, I think if not everyone, at least most of us used already Fiddler, right? Uh, there are a ton of things that you can do and debug. And indeed, I used it for so many reasons, especially to find uh, hidden requests or identify, uh, play around with the call a bit. To be honest, um, developing more 
endpoints APIs the last uh, two, three years or so. I didn't use it that much, but even there, there were moments that I wanted to be sure everything was under control and exactly, I wanted to be sure exactly what calls are made um, transparently from my .NET application. So for example, yep. trying to authenticate or something. So there are always reasons to use Fiddler, but to be honest, I've never seen or used these uh, hidden advanced techniques. And it seems to me that it might be even more than just a debugging tool. Um, how, do you think that it can be used as a quality assurance engineer tool? Can you write some sort of automation with scripts so you can repeat the same steps and find out if something is wrong? Yes, so you can do that. You can add the scripting. I didn't show it specifically, but uh, let me go back into classic here too. I can set up, and it's easy to reissue requests manually as well. So let me go. I can easily right click on any of these and say replay them, right? But yeah, uh, you yeah. can, you could use core as well. So if you have a .NET, I've, I've heard of people that are doing .NET programs where they want to do a lot of automation like that if you get beyond what script would let you do that's where fiddler core would make sense you basically embed the headless fiddler core into your .NET app and then you can drive it you know using classes and stuff to say go run these look at the responses um, all that kind of stuff so i think that would be an option as well yeah yeah but yeah i think sure. to me like i said the big deal is um I can passively watch network traffic in a lot of things, right? I could do Wireshark, I could do dev tools, and sometimes that works. But to troubleshoot the kind of problems I often deal with, being able to change stuff on the fly. So another example, we have uh, front-end developers that do CSS only, right? They wanna give me CSS changes and see how it would look in production. Well, I need to take it from them, embed it into my build process, deploy it, let them look at it, I showed them instead how to use, um, they were on a Mac, so I said, use Fiddler everywhere. They set up a rule. So now they do their CSS work locally on their own machine. They're just tweaking the CSS. They're hitting Control F5. It's going to my prod server and getting all the real stuff, but it's using their CSS. So they're literally tweaking and seeing exactly what it's going to look like as yeah. if that CSS was deployed. And that was a huge process time saver that you just wouldn't be able to pull off in a lot of other ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely agree. I, I've seen also the new Fiddler, Fiddler Everywhere. It's indeed more um, new, right? The UI yes. and looks looks uh, much better. To be yep. honest though, since I worked for Fiddler so many years, I sort of end up liking this spaceship approach that you have all the buttons in front of you to <laughs> Yeah, I've been using Fit. Well, I was trying to find my very first trace. I think the first trace I found was from 2008 that I actually kept with Fiddler. So I'm in the same boat. I've been using this for 13 years. So I know where everything is. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm gradually using everywhere more, but I'm running into a lot more people at conferences or at work that, you know, have had a Mac and never used Fiddler. And the everywhere is a great thing. And as they move more into it, the niche stuff that I do in here will be over there. Um, yeah, and then I'll just adapt and move. But I tend to probably be in classic more just because I'm using some of the features it's missing yeah. more. Like you said, I'm just, I'm used to it, but they're both good, so. Yeah, yeah. And is there any way to collaborate through the classic, through the old one? Because I've seen that you can do that with everywhere, but. Can you do yeah, so in the old one, I would traditionally just do the save all sessions. Yeah. I would save that archive file, and then I can certainly, and I do that a lot, I'll encrypt it um, if I'm sending it externally, and I'll email it to someone, or I'll email it internally, or I'll put it on a network, or I keep, I keep traces. So I hit my own server every six months or so from home and do a fiddler trace and save it for historical just so it, it happens. Someone will say, what did we used to do? Why did we do whatever? And I can go back and say, well, four mm -hmm. years ago, this is what the homepage looked like. You know, it was only a meg. Now it's three meg. I can save those things off in those archive files. Uh, but there wasn't a lot that was convenient built into Classic to do the collaboration. That was one of the things they really wanted to enhance with Everywhere, where literally, I don't want to keep open both of them all the time, but in Everywhere, you saw the, I can just click on the particular uh, session that I had saved 
and then I can just say, hey, I want to share this with someone, type in their email or say, I want to keep in the cloud. And that's what I was doing over here. You know, here's yeah. a session. I can just hit this share and share it with somebody. So it's just more integrated, stored in the cloud, uh, less security concerns because it's not being transmitted through the email. You know what I mean? So I don't have to encrypt the archive. Um, so yeah, that's one of the other advantages of everywhere. Yeah, I guess so. Then that's where subscriptions are, are amazing, right? This collaboration, probably this is what you can pay for. Yeah, so Fiddler everywhere now since version 2.0 is subscription based. So that's your other consideration is, you know, do you want new user interface, new features, being able to run on a Mac Linux? Is that worth the subscription to you per year? So it's only subscription based. You can have a free something account or with everywhere. Yes, as of two, uh, version 2.0. So that's the uh, other consideration okay. on classic versus everywhere. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In some cases, the classic might win. I don't know. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, one last question from my side: Is there a way to actually do things unattended? For example, you gave an example of how you stored some a response for historical reasons. Is there a way to programmatically do this and have it unattended, run every night or something, and get a? So I'm trying to think in Fiddler Classic or even in everywhere, I've got these stored sessions. I have not seen where I could come here and say, please, I'm going to leave Fiddler everywhere up and I just want you to reissue this request every five minutes and, and store that. I haven't seen anything like that in Classic mm -hmm. or here. If I were to try to do that, I would either do um, in Classic, I would look at scripting to see if that's mm -hmm. something scripting would do. Otherwise, I would look at core, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. I've never investigated the command line interface either. I don't know if you can tell Fiddler. Um, I'll have to go look at this now. I'm saying it. Can you run like a script that said, please run Fiddler headless, basically, and save the response file here and then kick that off from a script or a job? Uh, I'm going to make a note to look that up. I don't know if that's possible or not, but inside the tools themselves, neither one of them is really geared towards i want to be a client that's constantly issuing things on a schedule and saving them if that makes sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one solution i guess would be to use the fiddler core and write your own yes do that yeah uh, and i think uh, that's what most people would do is yeah. when you're when you're at that level uh embed the core inside a .NET app and then do it all programmatically from .NET and c sharp so yeah well that was super interesting and Changed my the way I see uh, Fiddler now because I, especially to be honest, I don't know, but I didn't know that you can actually um, spoof. I don't know how what the word should be the certificates. So about uh, um, uh, encrypted communication, I was just seeing that it was happening, but I had no idea that you can actually uh, spoof it like that and see what's in there too. I think, yeah maybe a few new hackers were born today <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah please use to... the tools for for good and not for evil yeah right? yeah but yeah it, it was a it was a smart solution because fiddler was a proxy and and it was you know between and wireshark had to do something similar wireshark says you can configure it to store off all the keys that were used which is you know a little it's a different approach but it watched all the traffic and it would store off the keys that were part of the handshake so that it could use them later to decrypt. Uh, I thought Fiddler's was pretty ingenious to do the, I'll act like a certificate authority yeah. and everything works. Yeah, it's quite smart. a good way to do it, so. Yeah, yeah. Super, let's see the chat here for a minute. There are a lot of thank you notes because it was indeed excellent what we've seen, uh, but no questions. It seems that you have a talent of explaining things and everything, <laughs> everything is well understood. I, I, I think, to be honest, since I've never used these advanced parts of the uh, fielder, it's also difficult to have questions about them. You usually have to start trying and searching things and right. then you come up with something that you don't know how to do. But uh, well, hopefully, yeah, hopefully at least you've seen um, things that you didn't know it could do 
Definitely. Like I, the host remapping, you know, I saw it Definitely. and I, for a long time, I thought I'm never going to use that and just kind of put it aside. But then there was a day where I had a problem and I thought, I know where I could do that. And that actually worked. And then I dug in and figured it out. And yeah, so hopefully, and like I said, I've got um, my email and my Twitter and such. You can always follow up with me if you do start to use it and have any specific yeah. questions. Yeah, I'm certainly yeah. open to that. I, I, you know, I had so many, now that you mentioned that in my career, one of the most big, uh, difficult problems that I was facing was that it's working on the server and it's not working in, so the opposite, it's not working on the production server and it's working here and what's right. happening. So many of the times we're just, it's not right, but yeah, the developers, as everyone else, make mistakes and they had a hard coded magic string or something. If it's development, do that environment, or if it's production. And this can right. solve those cases too. So that was very, very useful, actually. Yeah, I was at, at work one day and I stood up and somebody said exactly what you just said. It worked fine on, you know, you hear this every day. It worked fine yeah. on my machine. Yeah. I deployed it and it didn't work. Yeah. And I said, exactly. And it was a video or something. I said, You're sure you deployed the video? Oh, yep. So I said, All right. And they know when I come to their desk and they ask me questions like have Fiddler open. So they had Fiddler open. <laughs> we did the trace and it was 404. The video file did not get deployed. So despite the fact you knew that it was, it wasn't sitting where it was supposed to. And then I got up and walked and somebody else asked me something. And it was the same kind of thing, right? That you, you're sure that everything was set up right, but the yeah. simple trace showed 404 or yeah. whatever was wrong or pointed to the, like you said, pointed the wrong place than you expected becomes a lot more obvious when you can see the list of the requests. Definitely, definitely. So. Super, that was very useful for my debugging at least experience from now on. Well, good. So, thank you, thank you very much for joining You're welcome. Our, our event. Uh, it would be very nice to have you again sometime in the future. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And anytime you're interested, I got plenty of topics we could cover, so let super, me know. Super, super, of course, let's do that again, of course. All right. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, everyone, yep. for joining this event. Uh, see you soon. I hope with a real life event someday, some point. Uh, yeah. Have a nice evening. Right. And you, Robert, I don't know what time is. <laughs> it's there, noon, but... noon now, so just lunchtime. So. Ah, okay. So have a nice lunch. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, everybody. Ciao. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Thanks. Sorry guys, ciao everyone.